G'day everyone. <laughs> welcome, welcome to another Toolbox Tech Talk uh, this Sunday. Hey, it's good to have you back and uh, thanks for everyone for joining again. I'm getting a little bit of a fan club here, thank you. And uh, look, please feel free to straight away start asking questions. Today's all going to be about power systems, designing them for tiny houses. So that's the focus for today. Uh, so use the, the comments or chat window, uh, whichever platform you're coming through. So I'm streaming to YouTube, uh, Twitter, Facebook and LinkedIn. So please feel free to, to throw your comments in there and I'll see them. Even just give us a thumbs up, uh, a like, whatever, and it comes up as a little bubble so I get to see that too. That's a feel-good thing for me. Anyway, um, yeah, so what's been happening? Well, <laughs> today's been a pretty hard day here at the Smart Energy Lab. Uh, we've been installing a very large... Um, well, for me anyway, a 70 kilowatt tracking system. And uh, it's been pouring with rain and foggy and we've been up with heavy machinery, up ladders, uh, putting panels up, or not panels, uh, um, talk tubes up. So uh, that's, been, that's been a good start to the day. But anyway, um, so I'm going to go real tech today, but I've got a special guest I'm going to bring in in a minute, um, who's someone who actually lives in a tiny house. So I thought I'd start with your real world experience of what's involved in uh, power systems for tiny houses and anything else. So feel free to just throw a few questions in there while I've got her online. So um, it's my great pleasure to introduce my good friend and next door neighbour, Elise. Hi, Elise. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Great to have you on board and on the show and uh, coming from all the way 10 metres away in the house next door to me. <laughs> That's yep. great. Um, so, Elise, look, you, you've you been living in a tiny house for how long? Oh, God. Um, I think I'm about to go through after this summer, fourth winter. Fourth winter? Sounds about right. Yeah. And how's it been? So four years. I love it because it's uh, it's simple, it's easy. I like to spend a lot of my time outside growing food and, you know, being on the forest and in the community. Um, yeah, it's for a busy person who doesn't have much stuff, it's completely perfect and very sustainable, which is one of my greatest goals. I think you just mentioned a key item, a, a person who has, doesn't have much stuff. So you have to be pretty minimal, don't you? <laughs> Um, well, I suppose from moving one community to, to this one and only having one room at the last community and coming from a two-bedroom city, I suppose, over the years, it, just being aware of distilling down because of wanting to have less environment, environmental impact in all areas of my life. So, yeah. Cool. Not hey, much. Just a little tech thing. Can you centre yourself a bit? On the, you're a little off to one side. You might have to twist your laptop a little bit so that you're – that's it. Lovely. Great. So, yeah, thank oh, you. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Sorry to be off centre. <laughs> nice PJs, by the way. Yep. <laughs> oh, you're not supposed to see those. <laughs> So it, today's all about um, power systems and I was, thought I'd focus on tiny house power systems. Now, um, what was your expectation when, in terms of power when you uh, chose to get a tiny house built? Um, well, because I met with an architect about the design and um, because I had no idea what I was doing, it was he, we kind of went through how I lived my life and what I used and, you know, I'm, I'm quite a minimalist. Tiny house isn't about big screen TVs and um, lots of appliances, I suppose. Um, simple is best, like living simply is, you know, one of my things. So, yeah, we kind of identified what was that was about. And when I employed the electrician, we had a talk about it. And, of course, my you awesomely living across from me, like giving, um, you know, input to what could work and, and not work as well. But definitely less is best for me and just kind of really identifying that, you know, a fridge, a laptop, a phone, I don't know, a few lights. Yeah, it was pretty easy to yeah, have that kind of system for that, I suppose. I, I, yeah, I think I'm one of the lowest power users on the co-op. Is that correct? 
Uh, yes, apart from the wombats, I think you're down there amongst the lowest power users on the on the co-op. <laughs> um, yep. Uh, for those who are not familiar with uh, the setup here, we actually live on a, an off-grid co-op in uh, the Yarra Valley. So there's uh, about 70-odd people living here and 30 homes or so. Uh, we're in six clusters of houses. Uh, Elise and I are in the same cluster. And uh, we have a microgrid, actually, which services uh, the cluster. But each house has its own independence. And so um, Elise's tiny house has its own power system. So She's, she's autonomous, but she has, instead of having to have a backup generator, she can use the microgrid. So that's probably the only difference from uh, a totally freestanding t- a tiny home is that uh, you've got a microgrid for backup. Yeah, I think that's one of the bonuses about coming to this cluster and looking at other places to put my house. Like it just, you know, water was there, power was there, was there. I mean, ideally in a perfect world my biggest goal in life would be to be on no fossil fuels at all and so kind of looking at can I put a cold cupboard outside for winter for storing food so I wouldn't have to use a fridge like what are the options you know um, collecting more power of course for and storage but I suppose as the climate changes and kind of looking forward to the few good things about the tiny house is, um, you know, it's adaptable. And even like because I built the tiny house to be a cool climate house because of our location and how long our winters are and the climate, but, you know, I kind of feel like that's going to change over the years. And, um, yeah, I suppose that space is adaptable, so that's probably a bonus as well. Let's focus a bit on your energy um, appliances. So how do you light your house? Um, so I just have, um, the LED lights. I have like, um, very few actually, if I, for a head count of how much lighting I have in my house, is that, is that what you're saying, Glenn? I'm actually taking notes here because I'm going to use it in this, uh, in the design activity. So tell me how many lights you've got. So, oh, gee, this is going to test me because now I haven't been... I've just had, uh, for all you people out there, I've just had a hip replacement and so I'm at my neighbour's place and house for like almost three three weeks. So I seem to forget what's in there. I think there are two in the kitchen at the door. There's two, oh, two in the kitchen, one in the lounge room. There's a light on the overhead range hood. There's a light in the bathroom a light up in the loft bedroom and one lamp. Oh, and I have that groovy crystal lamp that you gave me, you know, I've got to be a proper hippie um, that you gave me the globe for. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's all the, oh, and of course the front sensor light, of course, for coming home. Yeah. So they're all my lights. Right. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So I just took little notes there. So we're going to do a little energy plan uh, just to see uh, what a similar house might use. Uh, what about cooking? How do you, what sort of energy sources do you use for cooking? I would love not to use gas, but I use gas at the moment. Um, as I said, being adaptable, it would be good to move to electricity at some point. So gas for cooking, gas um, instantaneous, you know, I guess for hot water, but I have a, a big, um, that, you know, that You've thing got, I bought, the solar hot water. <laughs> solar hot water, yes, but it hasn't, it hasn't been connected yet. So you, you currently, yeah. um, let, it's actually uh, in a derogatory term as a gas-free loader. That means uh, some of your energy comes from, from gas and it makes it look like you don't use much energy. Uh, but it is a transition fuel for you because, uh, you know, the cost of um, a, a solar system on top of the build price of your uh, tiny house was probably a little bit steep. So that's a good you know, transition is instantaneous gas to solar um, as you can afford it. Absolutely. And I think um, anybody that wants to come and install it, come and just give me a call. Come on down. Um, yeah. So <laughs> get the solar hot, hot water on, um, which would be awesome. I have an extractor fan in the composting toilet that has to run 24 7 because um it makes the composting toilet more usable and friendly i love that i don't use water for the toilet um there's an extraction fan in the range hood yeah so that's kind of like that yeah okay so i just put that down on the list of things um so 
In terms of heating, how do you heat your tiny house? Uh, yeah, so got the tiniest fireplace known to mankind. So, um, yeah, wood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that. That's where it's at right now. I mean, that might change in the future. Who knows? Solar farm, heating, wall panel. But I, I don't know. I use such little um, wood at the moment. It's Yeah, it's a dream to heat it. It actually stays hot pretty good, uh, warm overnight because I've learned how to tweak it to keep myself cosy. What about cooling? Yeah, that's an issue because I because of the design of the house, I didn't kind of, I don't know why I didn't think of this. So at the moment um, I've got blinds uh, over all the windows on the north side and one for the weather on the on the on the west side I've got blinds for the door where the sun comes beating in I have a barn door with fly wire and I'm just using a normal fan but there's definitely um what's a normal fan like, bit, like a pedestal oh, fan? just like a just like a one that goes like that that you plug in you buy from the electrical store just an air circulating fan a little desk fan that I just plug in yeah yeah, yeah, just a little fan, like, I mean, you know, um, that I just set up on the floor and it just rotates air. But, you know, there's definitely, I don't know, I'm so reluctant to adapt my inner environment for um, air conditioning because, you know, I like to spend a lot of time outside. But I suppose that's an option for the future. And also other builders have said um, to put in louvers in the roof to create airflow. There's definitely... Um, a uh, uh, kind of patio, balcony kind of, what are you called? Uh, yeah, one of those at the side to with a, you know, trellis to, I don't know, just create more shade and um, kind of more cooler environments. But definitely as we get hotter, there's probably going to have to be more thought put into that because, as I said, it's a cool design house, so it's not made with a lot of big opening spaces that that will need to be looked at. What about entertainment what, or, or office stuff? What have you got in that realm? I just have a laptop um, and I just blew, have a Bluetooth um, radio for music and entertainment. That's about it. So like phone, laptop, speakers, you know, I suppose there are, you wouldn't, wouldn't mind playing some records one day on a turntable, but um, where am I going to put that? <laughs> <laughs> Hang it from the ceiling. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a second loft that, you know, I'm waiting to expand my horizon into getting up there, but, yeah. What about laundries, washing machines, dryers, et cetera, anything like that? Yeah, so I suppose part of the attraction to me about living in this cluster is, you know, the awesome neighbours and the houses. And so when I parked my house in this cluster, I was kind of aligned under some my neighbour, Bindi's house, who I'm staying in now, as like one house, like a permit for 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 we as you glenn knows we sell shares and so we're kind of like one household so we share some facilities so i use her um washing machine there's a washing line outside her house i don't have an oven because that just seemed so insane to have an oven in such a small house so i come over and use her oven or the one in the fireplace in winter and cook some food and leave her some so i quite like the collaboration of community because like there are 30 washing machines and ovens and facilities up here. So why not share? That made sense. Cool. If you were to do it all again, what changes would you make in terms of the electricals and energy consuming devices? Um, I probably, because I had no idea, I, I, yeah, look, I'd probably look a little bit harder into controlling the natural environment inside because we have such extremes now and there are options to use nature around the house. But, of course, as we know, you know, like bushfire up here is a big risk. So definitely, um, you know, I've seen a lot of innovation in spaces, but I actually have never um, looked too hard into innovation of appliances. So I think there's... Um, you know, things get better all the time. There's definitely a lot of groovy stuff out there. So, yeah, I think I would design the house a little bit differently and probably make more more room for kind of, yeah, the temperature control and also cooking with all electric, but still that would be an issue in winter, um, yeah, but, you know. 
So just a couple of thoughts that came to mind, and just I'll roll them past you. Um, if you had uh, less constraint on energy, so you had a larger energy budget to play with, would you consider reverse cycle air conditioning so you could rapidly go from heating to cooling as you wished? Yeah, I think so because, you know, I like to think I'm, you know, I've spent most of my life working outdoors. I'm a bit of a tough chick and I can tough it out for half an hour when I get home to a cold house and, um I suppose the conve- the conve- you know convenience is a bad word these days, but yeah, convenience would be nice just to kind of perk it up when you get home and then go out and bring a wheelbarrow of wood in, you know, get it started. Yeah, but the, you know, on you know fire versus solar, you know, I think environmentally the solar would win. So. I've got actually got a yeah. suggestion from one of the viewers. I'll just bring this one online. Um, so Brian says um, heat pump hot water and induction cooker seem to be a solution to move away from gas. Uh, would you consider those? So is he talking about heat pump hot water as in in the fireplace or as in I don't uh, know what that means? Uh, it's an electric heat pump. So it's like a very efficient water oh. heater. Yeah, the, um, mm. there is actually one over here at the lab, so I should point it out to you sometime. But they're like three to five times as electricity efficient as a regular um, resistive element hot water service. Um, and they've got a very small peak demand. That means when you turn them on, they only draw like a 1,000 watts, not two and a half to 3,500 watts. So they're not a big load mm. on a small system. Um, uh, so they're a very popular choice if you don't have uh, access to the sun or you're constrained by roof area. Now, that I guess... Um, I might actually, I realised I was going to bring a picture up just to show people um, the, the house, if you don't mind. Oh, no, that's okay. Okay. Um, so <laughs> I'm homesick. Oh, my God. There it oh, is. little house. <laughs> um, so at the moment you look out the window at your house because you're in your neighbour's house <laughs> yeah, reco- recuperating. So that's the tiny house. Um, a couple of things just to point out there uh, is the power system on the side there has had a few um, upgrades, hasn't it? We've changed the inverter and we've added extra... Uh, lithium-ion batteries, uh, LFP batteries from Gen Z. So we stuck those in there because the original lead-acid batteries started failing. And we also had an inverter that died and we replaced it with a newer version. But uh, what I haven't shown is the solar, which is on the other side of the roof. I should have taken a picture, I realise. There's only room for four panels. And so two of them are PVT, which means photovoltaic thermal. That means they heat water as well as generate electricity. And two of them are just... PV panels. So you have the enormous amount of 800 watts of solar panels on your roof, which is pretty small. And so that is often a constraint for a tiny house is, you know, the the roof area. But, you know, for a tiny house that's not going anywhere, things like verandas, um, shade areas, even ground mount solar can be an option as well. Yeah, we've talked about that and I suppose it's kind of like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's been in the uh, the offing for a while. Anyway, I really appreciate you joining us um, just to introduce the, the real world of, of Tiny House Power Systems, Elise, and uh, I'll let you get back to relaxing on your Sunday. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your talk. <laughs> okay. See you, Elise. Bye for now. See ya. Wow. Well, that was great having someone who actually lives in a tiny house uh, talking to us about um, their experience. So now I'm going to get um, technical. So I said I'd I'd talk about designing a power system for a tiny house. Now, look, a couple of uh, um, uh, extensions really is the same principles uh, for designing a tiny house power system apply to designing a normal house power system or a large house power system or an enormous house power system. It really the principles scale and uh, I'm going to run through those. I based this um, lesson on uh, an Australian standard, or Australian New Zealand standard, AS4509.2, which is a standard for designing standalone power systems. Uh, it can be scaled to you know, uh, utility scale if you really wanted to, but there'd be some, um, some differences when you've got a utility scale system. But for, for even for large homes and homesteads, uh, the same principle uh, would apply. I should point out that I've really dumbed down 4509. 4509 Part 2 has got 16 pages of formulas for designing a standalone power system. Uh, And it's a really little bit engineering grade for what most people would need, particularly for something so small as a tiny house. So I've dumbed it down to six easy steps. 
And I'm going to run through those now with you. I should also flag that I run a five-day, or it's actually a 20-hour course over five days, so half a day for, for five days in a row, uh, in designing uh, a solar and battery storage system, whether it's on-grid or off-grid. And I've, my next course comes up next week, actually not this coming week, but the following one. Um, I think that's the 7th to the 11th December. Uh, if you're interested in enrolling on that course, it's delivered via Zoom, so it's a, you know, a, a, a sort of classroom environment where we all sit together and we you know, participate and, and there's assignments, etc. Uh, I should point out it's not a, an accreditation course for the CEC. It's actually just the skills and knowledge that you need to design a solar and battery storage system. I used to run uh, courses here face-to-face, -face, but since COVID, it's just really moved online. Um, but I'll probably get back to doing some face-to-face -face ones next year at some stage. So let's just dive into it. Um, I'll bring up my six easy steps. Now, I should point out um, uh, there's... This, uh, this process, I'm just going to run through using some real numbers. And I, I sort of rubbed out the ones that were there before, so you probably see some faints there. And uh, I'm going to use the loads that I just got from Elise. So this is uh, Elise's uh, load sheet here. Um, this is Elise. And uh, this is the kind of thing that you want to start with, is finding out what the customer requires. What, what are their customer loads? Um, it's, it's no good just kind of asking someone uh, how much power do they need, because... Uh, you're really, um, oops, got the wrong picture there. Uh, you, you're really not going to find out um, much about uh, their system by asking them how much power they use because they don't know either. You really need some methodology. Now, sorry, I'm just trying to bring up my little thumbnail picture. There it is. Okay, great. Um, so a good way to start is actually talking to them about what appliances they have uh, in their home and... Um, and listing them. So for, with Elise here, I, I quickly um, ran through her lighting requirements. Um, she said she had some LED lights in the kitchen. There were two of them. They're only five watts each. Um, uh, she had some uh, lights in the lounge. Uh, there were five watts each. There's two of those. And then I put the number of hours per day uh, in the next column. And I'd go through... Um, Ideally, you would do this for a summer and winter. So I'm just showing here summer usage, but ideally you would do two of these, uh, one for winter as well. And if you live in a tropical environment, you would probably do a wet season, uh, dry season variation. Uh, so you could see, you know, how, how energy use changed with the seasons. So let's just keep it real simple. We're just doing a single um, uh, load sheet, not looking at two variants, a summer and a winter. But to be honest, if you're off grid, and a tiny house, you have to find out what is the worst time of year to try and meet the load energy. Technically, it's known as the load resource ratio. Um, the, the, the amount of load energy versus uh, the solar resource uh, that you have available to meet that load energy. So it generally for a temperate climate, it is winter time, but in the tropics, it may well be um, you know, the hottest part of the year when there's a heavy air conditioning load. So it's not always uh, um, associated with winter time. So we go through this process and we um, basically multiply the, the power by the number of hours to come up with the number of watt hours. And so uh, just bringing my calculator up here, there's my calculator. Um, so it's not rocket science. This, most of this isn't rocket science, by the way. Most of this is just simple multiplication and addition, maybe a bit of the division, nothing more complicated than that. So 2 times 5 is 10, times 6 is 60. I can even do that in my head. So 60 watt hours of energy uh, is used for the kitchen. Uh, for, the, for the LEDs, LED lighting in the lounge, it's the same. 2 times 5 times 6. Uh, is 60 watt hours. Now, watt hours is a measure of energy. It's not watts per hours, it's watts times hours. The bathroom, she's just got one light. Uh, it's only probably on for a maximum of one hour a day, so that's five watt hours. It's pretty small. Uh, and uh, the sensor light only comes on for about a total of half hour a day, so put 0.5 there, so that's going to be five watt hours total. Uh, the extractor fan on the uh, composting toilet runs all the time. Uh, it's quite small. It's only three watts, but it runs 24 hours a day. So that's going to be uh, 72 watt hours. So surprisingly, uh, something like that little tiny fan on the composting toilet uh, is actually so far the biggest load. And uh, I should point out, most people forget about energy associated with the waste. They don't think about <laughs> the energy of their um, you know, underground uh, uh, waste treatment system. So a lot of off-grid systems have... Um, septic or, or aerobic systems that use quite a bit of energy. The desk fan in summertime probably, uh, it's 20 watts for two hours a day, that's 40. Uh, 
and she's got a, um, a stereo, but it's a Bluetooth stereo, so it's just a, a power miser. So it's only going to be about 15 watt hours, and the computer um, is 30 watts, and it's running for two hours a day, so that's 60 watt hours. Now, if you add all those up, you'll come up with a, a target for the whole day. Uh, so how many watt hours per day? So 60 plus 60 plus 5 plus 5 plus 72 plus 40 plus 15 plus 60 equals. So the enormous total of 317 watt hours per day. Now, uh, watt hours are a very small unit. Kilowatt hours are a thousand times bigger. So um, the equivalent of that would be uh, therefore, uh, so, well, hang on, therefore, uh, 0.317. Uh, kilowatt hours per day so oops bring that up a bit there so that's that's the amount of energy she uses per day so one thing we omitted in this whole thing I just realized was the fridge um, there is actually a refrigerator in her place and it's a small one but small doesn't always mean uh, efficient so unfortunately quite a lot of the very small fridges are quite inefficient they're designed really for, to be compact and therefore have minimal insulation but there are good small fridges so at least um, I'm pretty sure it's got a, a pretty good one but it would probably use up to, to twice as much as everything else so I'm guessing from measuring her house I think she was around a kilowatt hour per day uh, so how do you find this stuff out how do you find out how much energy an appliance use if it's not written on it see things like LED lights are pretty simple because it's written on them um, there's actually a, a label uh, on the on the package when you buy it so you can see what the energy use is um, but when it comes to something like a fridge you look at the star rating on the front of the unit when you purchase it now you can actually find out about uh, appliances by using a website called energyrating.gov.au. It's uh, both. It's a co. It's uh, uh, it's, it's also used in New Zealand as well. It's a, it's a collaboration between ICA and uh, Australia for um, anything that has a mandatory performance um, rating, um, mandatory mandatory performance energy rating, MEPS uh, energy scheme. Sorry, mandatory. Performance Energy Scheme MEPS rating uh, will have a star on it. So I'm just going to show you that website because uh, this is, oops, wrong one. Where are we? It's that one there. Okay, uh, this website here is really useful when you're trying to advise a customer or yourself on an efficient appliance. So looking for an efficient appliance, uh, you can go to this website and go to the registration database which is down here oh sorry i'm clicking the wrong screen registration database bottom right and the registration but database will um, give you a searchable index so here i can choose for instance refrigerators so i go down to refrigerators and freezers and i can search refrigeration freezers so you can narrow your search down by doing an advanced search and add a criteria and I might make the criteria that the star rating is um, uh, less, uh, greater than or equal to five stars. So we want only the very best ones. So we're only going to show the five star uh, refrigerator. So there's plenty of those. We might also want to limit our choices to a certain size. So total volume uh, is uh, less than or equal to, and we'll say 250 liters. So add that. There we go, Oops, search. So I'm just looking for small 250 litre uh, fridges. We'll remove that one, search, here we go. And oops, we found one. So that's how rare small five-star fridges are. There's only one on the list. And what's useful is the energy consumption per annum. So that number there, 85 kilowatt hours per annum is the useful number and you can use that to calculate per day. So remember that number, 85 per annum. So we're going to divide that by 365. So I'll just go back to my overhead drawing. Here we go. And we'll take the, the 85 figure. It's written on the star rating on the front of the unit. So if you don't know where to look in a database like this, if you're actually in a shop, on the star rating um, label uh, in the middle is the energy consumption per annum for fridges. And so uh, that divided by the number of days in the year will tell us our average daily consumption. So let's imagine um, Elise has this sub-zero fridge. Uh, it's 114 litres, so it's quite a small underbench style fridge, I'd say. And so where are we? Refrigerator, 
There it is. She's got one. And we don't put the hours per day because the fridge is on all the time. We don't, um, sorry, the power all the hours per day. We just put the total figure, which is 232 watt hours. So 232 watt hours per day. So that's going to add to this total here. So this total then becomes uh, plus 0.317. Uh, so she's up to 0.5, we'll call it 0.55, we'll round it off, uh, kilowatt hours per day. So about half a kilowatt hour per day. Uh, that's that's an amazingly low number compared to what a typical home would use. A typical home is up around um, up around 20 kilowatt hours per day. So uh, that's one of the big pluses of tiny homes is that they're, they're oops, I burnt myself on twice, they're energy misers. Uh, they really, really save uh, energy by the fact there's not a lot of rooms, there's only one, maybe two, there's not a lot of appliances. Uh, so they're forced to be very, very energy efficient by design. So that's, that's our little target. We're going to design a system for 0.55 kilowatt hours per day or 550 watt hours. So let's go back to my formulas here and um, have a look at this. So here we go. Um, bring myself on as a little thumbnail. There we go. Little floating bubble. And uh, we put up here the number of watt hours per day. So 550 watt hours per day. I'll make it a bit darker. Five. 50 watt hours. Oops, something underneath there. Oh no. Some rubbish. Um, must have been my lunch was under there. So, 550 watt hours per day is our target. Now, feel free to ask any questions if you're watching this live. Um, go to the comments and type in questions in there, or, uh, or even just comments. Feel free to, you know, give us a thumbs up if you're enjoying this. And um, feel free to subscribe to my channel if you happen to be coming via YouTube. So battery system voltage, why is this number two? It's really to do with the mathematics because uh, the battery system, we're going to calculate further down the battery capacity in amp hours, so we need to know what the battery system voltage is. Now, generally, uh, the voltage will also determine the type of appliances that you can choose because if you're trying to run some appliances directly off a battery, there's not many once you get beyond 24 volts. So really, 12 volts or 24 volts are pretty popular in small, very small applications. And I'd say a tiny house is an area that you could do it uh, at 12 or 24 volts, um, but it will limit you on your inverter capacity because there's not many inverters, quality inverters anyway, that go beyond 24 volts. So Elise actually has a 48 volt system, and uh, so I'll, I'll use that as an example, but really uh, 48 volt is common um, for nominal voltage for a, a lead acid system. She's actually got a lithium ion um, battery system in parallel with an old dying lead acid system. So <laughs> we actually upgraded it um, by paralleling it, but that's another whole story. So 48 wouldn't actually be true if it was purely a lithium system. Lithiums are generally a little bit higher, so you know around the 51 to 54 volts. Uh, then we need to calculate something called the load sub subsystem efficiency. If you're going to deliver 550 watt hours per day of energy, uh, you need to allow for the losses. And the losses are the, the efficiency of the battery storage system, what we call the round trip efficiency. So some of the energy that you put into the battery, you don't get back again. Then there's the wiring losses, some of the, um, the losses of, uh, is heat in your wires, and some is the efficiency of the, an inverter if you've got AC appliances that convert from, um, from DC to AC. So I'm just going to pick some typical numbers in here. So um, if this was a lead-acid battery system, uh, the efficiency's not crash hot, so it's around 87%, which is a factor of efficiency of 0.87. Uh, we multiply that by the efficiency of our cable system, so we're allowing for up to 5% um, uh, loss in our cable system and a inverter efficiency uh, for battery inverters, it's generally lower than what solar inverters are, uh, so I'm saying around about 92% efficient. Uh, and you just multiply all of those through. I just saw a, a question or a comment come through from Bradley. Thanks, Bradley. I think you deserve a gold star for my most regular participant. Um, Bradley says, what about the pros and cons of 12 volt versus 240 volt AC? I'm assuming, Bradley, you mean directly running appliances off, say, 12 volts as opposed to 240 volts AC. Um, just off the top of my head, uh, it's, you definitely have less losses if you directly run something off DC. 
Uh, it does limit you in the sort of appliances you can get. They are generally designed for like uh, RV markets. Uh, but when, when you look at a tiny house, it's not m that much different than an RV. So small cable runs, therefore voltage drop isn't such a big issue. Um, you likely have small loads, like just a couple of lights, not a whole house full of lights. It does mean that you've got um, a guaranteed way of keeping those appliances running independently of the inverter, which means the inverter losses aren't considered, so that's a, that's a gain. And also, if a calamity happened like your inverter failed, any DC um, sources, uh, DC appliances like lights, maybe a water pump even, um, won't stop working. So that's a bit of a bonus. So I often think for very small applications like a tiny house, actually having a mix of DC and AC isn't a bad idea. It makes for more complicated wiring. You've got to plan it. You've got to plan your AC and DC wiring for um, the tiny house. And there is regulations around what they call segregation. You've got to keep them separate. You can't all put them in the same conduit. You've got to have 50 mils of separation or separate conduits. But it can be done. Um, even my house here, when I built it 10 years ago, I put in uh, DC lighting. So I put in 12-volt lighting throughout the house. I even put 12-volt socket outlets in some of the rooms just in case. Because um, you only get one chance generally when you're wiring up a house because you seal it all up and it's not much fun trying to pull plasterboard off the wall again. So thanks for that one, Bradley. Definitely uh, pros and cons. Uh, of course, the pro is for AC, there's just a huge range of appliances. So uh, that's definitely a big plus. So let's um, just do the sum here. Um, my calculator's gone to sleep. Oh, wants to know who I am. Uh, okay. So to t find out what our subsystem efficiency is, this is the load side, we multiply these together, 0.87 times 0.95 times 0.92, and that's an overall subsystem efficiency of a factor of seven, 0.76. Another way of stating that is 76% efficient. So of the energy that we put into the system, we only get 76% of that back. So we've got another another comment here uh, from Ray. Let me just bring that one up. Thanks, Ray. So Ray's um, uh, saying 12 volt will have some voltage loss uh, if it's a long cable beyond a few meters for high draw devices such as fridges. Agreed. And 240 volt will have losses in converting to mains via the inverter. So it's a balancing act. That's right. So really, distance is the enemy of extra low voltage systems. It's say 12 or 24 volts. But when you're talking a tiny house where it might only be six metres long, it's doable by selecting your cable sizes. I often say that um, voltage drop on a cable is a self-inflicted loss. You choose the cable, you choose the loss. Um, but do, certainly when you do have high currents, like if you're drawing 100 amps to run an inverter at high power, that's a lot of current at 12 volts and a lot of loss. So you've had very heavy cables and expensive cables. But for something small like LED lighting, uh, not such a big deal. Okay, so thanks for that one, Ray. That's great. Um, now we're going to work out what's called the amp hour demand based on the uh, A, B, and C. So it's six steps, right? It's not that not that complicated. A, B, and C, we just plug those into this formula here. So we take A, which is 550 watt hours. We divide that by our system uh, voltage which is 48 volts and we divide that by our sub load subsystem efficiency which is 0.76 and we'll get a different answer than I had last time okay so 550 divided by 48 divided by 0.76 equals so that means the demand on a daily basis from the battery is 15 amp hours. Now it's not amps per hour, it's amp hours, amps times hours. So that's the daily demand. Now don't run away and go and buy a 15 amp hour battery. Uh, there's a, a bit more to it because that comes down here, if, what size battery system to get. Now E is probably the hardest part. Actually, I lie. I generally say A is the hardest part, but selecting your appliances is the hardest part or even finding out what their power rating is. But uh, we've done it. We just ran through that load sheet and found out uh, what the um, load energy requirements were. But you know, often in a new build, um, it's, it's difficult. People don't actually have the appliances yet. I often think it's the biggest opportunity to make the biggest savings. Because energy efficiency is the cheapest form of energy, the energy you never needed, sometimes called negawatts, the watts you never needed are negawatts. So we come down to E, which is sizing a PV system. Now, I'm assuming that this system is designed so that 
Uh, even during the poor parts of the year when the weather's poor and there's not much solar, uh, we have enough solar energy to still replace all the energy we took out of it and the losses. That's very important, and the losses. So we start with um, plugging in our load energy requirement, which is 550, and now we divide it by something curious called peak sun hours, or PSH. More, tec more technically, it's um, kilowatt hours per square metre of solar radiation on a surface. Now, that's where it does get technical. That's where you do need some actual data. And uh, there are online sources for this. Uh, NASA has a, a service, um, but it's only for, um, uh, for equator-facing panels. But then again, if you happen to be facing the equator, i.e. in the southern hemisphere, the panels face towards the north, um, it will give you some data. The Bureau of Meteorology here in Australia and NIWA in New Zealand also published quite a lot of solar radiation data, but both of well, um, the Bureau of Meteorology only publishes horizontal radiation data. That means if your panels are, are perfectly flat, uh, once you tilt them, they'll generally work better, certainly if you're uh, in a more southern latitude. So this might be the hardest one to find. Now, I happen to know what it is for here at Mount Tulibuong, which is in the Yarra Valley, uh, 65 kilometres from uh, Melbourne. Uh, in wintertime, we get 2.7 peak sun hours. Now, that, I've chosen 2.7 because that's the worst uh, load resource ratio for homes here. It's winter time, it's June, people are indoors more, they're using more power. And so uh, that's when we design that, that with low solar radiation, we can still meet the energy demand. So we factor in our efficiency factors um, for our PV system and also our subsystem efficiency. Now, the PV system efficiency here is actually a little bit ticky too. Um, it's to do with um, how a solar panel uh, it changes its production due to temperature. Now, this is probably when I need to, to bring a, another tech thing up, data sheet for a solar panel. So let me just bring this one up. Here we go. So here's the solar panel. Um, this is a very big panel, actually. These are the ones we're putting on the solar farm at the moment. They're two metres by one metre. Um, uh, they may be a little bit too big for a tiny house, but I've just grabbed a data sheet off the internet to show you. So, um, so you, if I scroll down to where it tells me what's known as the uh, temperature ratings at standard test conditions. So STC is standard test conditions. And it tells me that the power of my solar panel will reduce, because it's a negative temperature coefficient, by 0.35% per degree Celsius from test conditions. Test conditions are 25 degrees Celsius on the cell, on the, on the solar cell. And so it's not the ambient temperature, it's the temperature of the cell when the sun's shining on it. So even in wintertime, your, your cells will heat up. Um, so how do we find this out? Well, let me bring another sheet up. Now, I have done a whole toolbox tech talk on this, so I'm not gonna go into great detail, but here I'm showing um, that this is standard test conditions here, and at standard test conditions, uh, the panel might have a certain um, voltage at maximum power, uh, and its power coefficient, in this case, uh, is 0 0.30, I think it was different from the, the Longy solar panels we just looked at, but it's just saying that as the temperature increases, we're losing power. So we lose voltage, that's the reason why we lose power. A solar panel, uh, is pretty linear on current uh, over temperature, but with voltage, that's where it changes. As it heats up, we lose power. And so when a panel's um, sitting at 38 degrees, sorry, when the air's at 38 degrees ambient, the cells are going to be a whole lot hotter. Generally, cells are 25 to 35 degrees hotter. Uh, so in this case, looking at the magenta, um, I've got 43 degrees rise from test conditions. And so it's probably a summertime temperature at 38 ambient, that's pretty hot. Uh, we're losing 12.9% um, of our power. But here's the, the rub. We're designing this system for wintertime in Melbourne. And in wintertime in Melbourne, it's not 38 degrees, thankfully. <laughs> it's probably more like down here somewhere, like you know, 10 degrees. So the, the power loss is much, much less. So that means I can um, go back to my uh, chart over here and consider a much lower figure for thermal losses. But the PV system efficiency is actually a whole bunch of subsystems within the PV. Uh, so we've got, for instance, I think I might even have a slide here. Sorry, a hand-drawn picture. Here we go. Um, of PV system efficiency. So this is... Uh, 
a summary of all the losses in a PV system, we've got things like the big one, which is thermal derating. That's where you lose uh, generally most of your power unless you live in a very cold climate. We're talking zero and below. Uh, you'll almost always lose power as the panels warm up when the sun shines on them. You'll have a certain amount of manufacturing tolerance, uh, so that could be nothing. So most panels these days are actually what they call positive tolerance, so really there's no loss. Um, then we've got our losses in our wire, which is, as I said before, self-inflicted. Uh, the standard for PV systems in Australia and New Zealand, ASNZS 5033, recommends a maximum of 3%. So I put 3% loss, which is expressed as a factor 0.97. Um, the charge controller or inverter conversion efficiency depends very much on what this is, but uh, generally it's, it's in the 90s, so uh, solar inverters are very good, and at 0.96 would be typical for a solar inverter, but if you on a, um, a small, uh, on a tiny house for instance, you probably don't have room for a big solar inverter, you're probably going to use a maximum power point tracker, which are very compact, and if you've never um, heard about maximum power point trackers, uh, what do you know? I've got a data sheet for one just here. Now, I actually specifically chose this one um, because it's a great choice for a small system. Now, this is a, a Victron uh, Smart Blue Solar. I think this is the Smart Blue Solar. Yes. And so these actually have Bluetooth as well. Uh, and if I can just zoom in a bit on that for you. Okay, I'll zoom in so it's nice and big. Here we go. So this thing is, uh, you know, about 100 mil square. It's quite small. If you look down the bottom here, it's got six terminals, battery plus or minus, PV plus or minus, and load plus or minus, which means it can be used to control uh, some loads. So you can connect, for instance, your lighting to this, uh, uh, and it will turn it off if the batteries get low. It can even be used as a, um, a nightlight system, so at night time it turns the lights on for you. So it can do some smarts. But MPPTs are very, very efficient. One of the things I like about this, uh, particularly for applications like RVs and tiny houses, is the monitoring is your phone. You don't have to go and buy an expensive display. Uh, you can just get your phone. It connects via Bluetooth, and it gives you both real-time monitoring and um, t over time. So it will give you a, histor a historical pr production. So if you look at that second picture of a phone, bottom left, it's showing the production on after the uh, last five days. This is really, really nice to have. But this is the smallest unit or one of the smallest units sits. Um, they rate them in their maximum input voltage. So if I look over here, um, oh, I just hit it, sorry. Uh, it's got a maximum input voltage of 75 volts, which is probably really just one panel. You could connect to that one in series. Uh, and 10 amps out, they do bigger ones, 15 amps out. Uh, they could do higher voltage ones, 100 volts, 15 amps, and a larger one, 100 volts in, which would be two panels in series, uh, and 20 amps out. So... This is a great choice uh, for DC charging uh, for a small system. Just a reminder, if you've got any questions or comments, throw them in there. Um, pretty quiet. I've got a few hellos. Thank you very much for that. So going back to my explainer, um, and we talked about losses here. We'll go back to that. So the PV system includes thermal losses and all those other ones, and it depends very much on what time of year you're designing it for. So I'm choosing winter time here in Melbourne, and I'm going to say that my thermal losses will be very low, and I'm keeping all my other losses totaled to less than 10%, which is an efficiency factor of 0.9. Almost done. I just put in the um, number I had up here, C, which is the load subsystem efficiency, 0.76, and the answer is the number of watts of panels I need. Um, so this is exciting. I haven't done this one before, so let's have a look. So we go 550 divided by the peak sun hours for the location and the inclination that I'm mounting my panels at, 0.9 uh, efficiency for the PV system, and 0.76 for my load losses. And so I need the enormous sum of 297 watts of panels. Wow. That's pretty amazing. That's really one panel. <laughs> so um, it's very doable. I said that Elise had room for 800 watts, well, she's got 800 watts of panels on her tiny house. Uh, and if that number was true for her, but actually I think it's more like one, I think she's a bit higher than 550, uh, she'd only need 300 watts. So um, there's a minimum 
There's no no maximum. Actually, oversizing makes a lot of sense, and I'll come to that in a second. And lastly, so we're nearly there. We've nearly designed a standalone power system. Um, the last step is uh, battery sizing. Now, uh, D is the demand, the amp hour demand. So we worked out it was 15 amp hours. So we'll put a 15 in there. On a daily basis, we've got 15 amp hours being drawn from the battery. Now, this is the big one. How many days of autonomy do we want? The way it's worded in the uh, design standard, ASNZS 4509.2, assumes a total eclipse for a certain number of days. Of course, we don't have such a thing. So it, it basically takes the premise that if you have absolutely no renewable energy input at all, um, how long can you run for? Or do you design the system to run for? Now, a good principle, and this is what's mirrored in ASNZS 4509 Part 2, is if you have no auto start generator, five days of autonomy, and if you have an auto start generator, two days of autonomy. Uh, that's your range, two to five. You can be beyond that, but th that's a good working number. Now let's imagine that Elise was, didn't have a um, connection to a microgrid and didn't have an auto start backup generator, and we put five days of autonomy in there. The idea of five days is so that you can get through the weather cycles. You can get through the, you know, the three or four days of bad weather and the sun comes back and your battery system gets recharged. If you've only got two days of autonomy, basically after two days of rain, you've got to go and start the backup generator. So we're choosing five here, uh, and we do that, and then we divide it by the maximum depth of a discharge that we choose to take our batteries to. Now, this depends very much on the technology. Now, I, I chose lead-acid um, here as a 48-volt lead-acid system. I actually should put that in brackets, so I'll call it lead-acid. Now, lead-acid batteries generally don't like deep discharge. Uh, a good sort of rule of thumb is about 50% maximum depth of discharge for a reasonable life out of a lead-acid battery system. If it's a, a standby system that hardly ever gets called upon, then maybe deeper than that's okay. And if you go shallower than that, you'll certainly make it last longer, but you're sort of over-investing in, in your unused capacity. Um, this is where uh, more modern technologies like lithium batteries have a big advantage. They often have 90 or 95 percent, or you know, many, many, um, much more usable capacity compared to their nominal rating. Um, but we've chosen lead acid here, so let's put in a 50 percent, which is a, a factor of 0.5. It's a 0.5 there, and let's see how big in amp hours does our uh, 48 volt battery system need to be. So I get my calculator out again. And so 15 times 5 equals, oops, you can't see that. 15 times 5 equals 75. Divide it by our maximum depth of discharge, which is 0.5. And we need 150 amp hours of, uh, of 48 volt uh, lead acid battery. There you go. And that's exactly what I've got in a little training trailer out here at the Smart Energy Lab, <laughs> just by chance. I didn't plan it this way. Uh, and it's, it would uh, certainly deliver that sort of energy uh, in wintertime. In fact, it's got uh, 660 watts on the trailer, so it's got more than this. Now, this is where I'm coming to this thing about over oversizing of your solar. Oversizing the solar gives you a lot of advantages. Um, the, the original premises in, in, in 4509 was to minimise uh, expense and keep the system just the right size. But what's happened is solar panel prices since that standard was written over 15 years ago have really come down in price. And so oversizing isn't that expensive. It's also, for those of you who happen to be in Australia, uh, you receive a rebate for solar panels which covers virtually all the cost of the panels, not the racking and the labour, but just the materials. So really, um, oversizing isn't that expensive if you have the space. But the other big advantage of oversizing is it means you can bring down your days of autonomy because uh, if you've got an oversized system, let's say it's twice the size you need instead of 300 watts of panels, you've got 600 watts of panels, even on a poor day, you'll still be getting some input. So you're drawing less from your batteries during the day. So that sort of stretches out your days of autonomy. So you could probably drop this to three. But, you know, I, I think for that sort of size, it's, it's probably not worth it. But oversizing, definitely a benefit. Also, um, one of the, the secret benefits of solar panels is they cool. <laughs> they keep the sun off your roof. In terms of thermal load on a building, um, they completely block the direct solar radiation. So there's a lot to be said for oversizing uh, for both energy and for cooling benefits. 
Um, so I can see another question come in here. Uh, just take myself off screen. There we go. Um, so bring it up. Brian says, uh, Power Plus have a great range of lithium. Thanks, Brian. Um, you're the honorary sage, sell, sales agent for Power Plus Energy. Uh, look, I, I must admit, I'm a big fan too. I've got uh, what's known as the the tower of power here at the Smart Energy Lab. Um, I even did a uh, interview with Bradley and Craig from Power Plus Energy a few months ago uh, here on the uh, Toolbox Tech Talk. Uh, so yeah, know them well. It's a Melbourne-based company, uh, Australian-made lithium-ion batteries. They're proving to be extremely popular. But uh, yeah, so thanks for that one, Brian. Uh, lithium, I think, is a game changer for tiny houses, particularly because of the weight and compactness. Now, I didn't talk about weight, but you know, these these 150 amp hour 12 volt batteries are about uh, 40, 50 kilos. So if I need four of them for a 48 volt system, that's about 200 kilos of batteries I've got to find a home for. And if this tiny house is relocatable, that's quite a lot of extra um, uh, uh, weight to add to that building. Also, um, they do. Uh, under charge conditions, a small amount of hydrogen and oxygen is released, so you've got to have ventilation for them. They can't be in a sealed box underneath a, a seat, for instance. Um, so that's another issue. Also, they don't like getting hot, so you don't want to put them where the sun shines too much. So really, lead acid has a lot of negatives. Um, even though it's been around for a long time, you could say it's the sort of steam power equivalent of modern, um, energy, of modern internal combustion engine or EV vehicles. Uh, it's getting a little bit long in the tooth. Um, Okay, so David, thank you, David. I've got a question coming in here. This is question and answer time because we're going to wrap in a few minutes. So you get your questions in. We'll, we'll generally finish uh, at the top of the hour. So David says, uh, what size inverter would you choose, taking into consideration oversizing the PV a AC output based on maximum demand? Excellent question, David. Now, I did think about doing an extension on this uh, particular design on uh, sizing inverters, but actually it's a bit of a big subject. So I'm going to do another toolbox tech talk on maximum demand. Um, calculations for standalone power systems. They're a bit different. And if you're wondering what maximum demand is all about, um, you can actually uh, you know, choose an inverter. For instance, let's say you choose a one kilowatt inverter. Uh, but if you put too many appliances on at the same time, you exceed its capabilities and it can shut down. Generally, inverters are well protected these days, so they don't blow up, they just shut down. So uh, understanding what the, the considerations are for maximum demand, what surge demand is, uh, and what um, power factor effects have on surge demand as well. So all of that needs to be considered. So thanks, David, for the question, but I will be covering that in another Toolbox Tech Talk. It might even be next week. We'll see. Um, got another one here coming in from Josh. Thanks, Josh. Looks like you're having a cuddle with your cat in the picture there. Oh, your dog, sorry. Um, you're losing a lot of lifespan at 50% depth of discharge with most batteries, and some batteries need 5 to 10% DOD per day. I should point out that 50% depth of discharge is over the days of autonomy. Now, I, I chose five days of autonomy, so that means... 50% after five days, not 50% every day. So definitely agree with you, Josh. 50% every day would be tragic for a lead-acid battery, but over five days, it's only 10% per day. So uh, that's important consideration. Um, and uh, Josh goes on, Bradley will elaborate, but running lithium too hard will also reduce lifespan. Really, uh, just about any battery system has its limits and uh, understanding what uh, the wear and tear on a battery system is based on what's known as the C um, C rate demand. So if you're you know, d taking the full capacity over one hour, that's one C. That's pretty intense out of a lithium battery, but some can do it, but that's pretty intense. Um, with a lead acid battery, that might be exceptionally <laughs> intense. Um, Thanks, Brian. You too. You're, you're a good contributor here. Um, so Brian's just letting me know that it's 42 degrees here today. I guess you're in New South Wales sweltering away in the heat wave that you're going to have for a few days. Um, just to let you know, it's cold and raining here. Um, <laughs> it's uh, a very different climate in, in the Yarra Valley. Um, I, was just, I think I had a picture from today. Where, I, where did I put it? Um, yeah, so uh, <laughs> I can gloat that we're, we're having colder weather than you, but uh, uh, generally, that's not a plus uh, in wintertime. Anyway, um, 
Well, just a winding up for today. Thanks again to everyone for turning up for Toolbox Tech Talk. And for those of you who are new here or don't know about the Smart Energy Lab, um, I run training courses, uh, various training courses online these days. I'd, I've been doing three-day uh, electrical inspection training courses primarily aimed at electrical inspectors or those installers who really need to know their standards well. Uh, well, they all do, but they sh it's really aimed at electrical inspection. I've run a, a five-day, it's four, 20 hours over four, five days, a course on standalone so and hybrid, which is, um, I call it solar and battery. Um, I'm doing a special course coming up later I think it's uh, in December, which is just on um, designing and installing a battery uh, system for on-grid or off-grid. So it's really looking at the battery standard, the new battery standard, 5139, um, nothing else. So it won't be covering solar, won't be covering um, uh, inverter systems, just looking at battery types. So anyway, if you're interested in any of those courses, just go to solarquip.com. Um, I probably should have put that down somewhere, but anyway, solarquip.com, that's me. So uh, thanks, everyone.